I have with me Aaron Soleimani, who's an associate in our uh, California office. And just to give you a quick two-second review of Mesner, we're a, a firm that's headquartered here in Denver. We've got about 110 lawyers. We have offices in California, New York, Las Vegas, Salt Lake, San Francisco, uh, LA, Newport. Uh, we general corporate works. So we do everything, uh, everything but essentially criminal law and divorces. And so we've got a really short time frame, so I'm going to go through this fairly quickly, this initial presentation. The idea, hopefully, is that um, we can get some questions that, that you might have. And we're wanting to basically, I know when we talk about blockchain and, and legal issues, it's always, you know, what, what token is the security? And we want to kind of like raise our gaze up from that and think about all the other legal implications that you should be thinking about if you're in the process of, or starting or have a company uh, in the blockchain space. And so, like I said, we're going to go through and talk about kind of key points. We had a, this, a discussion yesterday about smart bootstrapping, about the idea that rather than waiting until you are going to raise some money or rather than waiting until you have uh, an issue that you need lawyers to work on, thinking more about lawyers as uh, a partner or as a consultant and not just as a task-based uh, work product and that we're able to then help you proactively benefit from doing you know, these things that you want to do later on by having us engaged earlier in the process. Uh, you know what, we're here to basically help you work with the public, the government, and really all of your, all of your uh, stakeholders in your corporation, whether it's employees, partners, uh, your community that you get involved in, we, you know, you end up having legal issues essentially with all of those, all those groups, and, and we, we can talk about that in a minute about how we can be a part of that. And common, common areas for especially startups and entrepreneurs, things that we usually see companies coming to us for. Uh, obviously, it's the initial stages of business formation, tax issues, uh, all of the regular corporate documents, operating agreements, depending on what kind of entity you want to be. There's all kinds of questions around. We get it all the time, of, do I want to be an LLC, do I want to be a C-Corp, uh, do I, for my tax status, do I want to be a S corporation or a disregarded entity, or, you know, those types of questions. And it's common, uh, an issue where it's not a one-size-fits-all for everybody, and so we need to talk to people about the facts of your specific situation and what might be best for you. Um, and then we often get into general corporate governance issues after you've created this, this company, after you've started to build it, issues around governance, how do you and your partners work through issues about who's in charge of what, how do we issue uh, distributions, uh, additional capital raises, that type of thing. And then also we often talk with folks about your exit strategy, what are you going to do, what's the plan for this business, what are we going to, do we have a specific time frame, uh, are we going to let it run, are we going to bring in more people, how, how are we going to look at that. And I think that's that's a bit more of the same it, areas where we tend to work with people on. Uh, I think I hit most of those. IP and employees. So obviously, if, once your company gets to the point where you're adding employees, there's lots of uh, both proactive issues and then things that come up with employees. And then often in this space, a common uh, issue is IP. How do we uh, how do we deal with that? How do we own it? Um, and how do we protect it? Is often the issues that we're dealing with. Um, Back to smart bootstrapping. So in the startup community, it's often uh, where folks are trying to do this is with as little expense as possible. They use online uh, programs like, uh, uh, Cooley Docs. what's that? Cooley Docs. Cooley Docs, yeah, online, uh, you know, just the standard templates. And we see those all the time in our offices. Uh, and, you know, honestly, that might get people what they need in, if they don't have an issue, if they don't have a dispute. Uh, when they do, they usually are not uh, adapted to their situation, and that's usually where the problems come up. Um, or they haven't thought about what they don't know. And so that's a big one that we always are trying to explain to folks is that it's, it seems like a simple process to have a contract with somebody, to have the two of you agree to these things, and, but there's, and, and using one of these online templates, you'll go through the standard provisions, and the problem though is that you don't know what's not in that agreement and what are standard marketplace terms or similar agreements that lawyers who do this on a regular day in day out basis come across. Uh, and I 
happy. And then, yeah, finally, well, the important point, as I hit on earlier, is to think about lawyers not just as a task-driven uh, uh, product, that we should be seen as somebody who's interested in your business, knows your industry, understands the language, understands all the common issues that you have in this industry, and that we can be a part in certain parts throughout the phase of your growth, that there are key strategic points where bringing in a lawyer might save you both time, money, and hassle that, that uh, you might have if you forget to do that or don't do that, and then bring to us. Uh, the common example is when we have companies come to us that want to raise money or they've got an investor or they've got uh, somebody who wants to purchase their, their business, and what makes that complicated is that they have not done the things they should have been doing through the life of their business. They have not maintained the records. They have not set the structure properly. They haven't thought about the tax consequences. And that creates those more expensive, more hassle uh, in those situations where we haven't done those things preemptively. And with that, I think what we'd like to do is just if there's questions from the group. Uh, Michelle and Paul are here as business owners who have dealt with uh, law firms and lawyers in different situations and can provide a, a view from that perspective as the client about what, what they like and don't like about lawyers. And then Aaron and I are here to, you know, broadly speaking, give you our perspective on how companies have done things right. Uh, I always have to give the caveat that we're not, there's no lawyer client relationship here. We're not giving legal advice, we broad general questions and broad general answers. And with that, we'll open it up. I love that disclaimer. <laughs> that was very smooth. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. I, I got a question for Michelle. So you just uh, were able to get approval for Rebel Time. So maybe you can tell the audience a little bit about that journey and how you feel about you know, how the Colorado process works. Yeah, sure thing. Um, so the company I started, Rebel Kind, uh, recently filed for um, securities exemption through the state of Colorado with the Colorado Token Act, which was actually um, approved early, I think, in Q1 of this year, and then just went into effect August 3rd. Um, and basically, what that allows is for companies to have a utility token, um, essentially be able to have a token that represents some form of value and within a network, so you are exchanging it with that value and it has some sort of functionality within your network. So whether it's, in our case, and, and in most cases, it's processing transactions or interactions, um, just the same way you would go to a casino and you can use it for within the casino. Um, so that's what our company, that's what RevoKind has done. And yeah, we're really excited about it. We were the first ones to actually um, file for that and be approved, which is exciting. Um, yeah, and there's other exciting steps. I, we're hoping to do that on the national level um, within the year, depending on the changing regulatory space there as well. Good question. Yeah. Okay. I'll just add, just so it wasn't us that did that, so I'd like to know, like, what was your your perspective of the legal work that you guys did? Anything that was outstanding was things that you thought could have been done better. Well, we've been following the, the regulatory space for a long time, and we've had we've, the important point I think is that we've had legal counsel involved from um, from about 2017, uh, the fall of 2017. And if we hadn't had that from the beginning, we wouldn't and built those relationships. I don't think that we would have been as prepared to move when we did when we needed to. So that's I think one of the big takeaways is just to be. Um, it's, and what this panel or what this workshop is really about is is about working with your attorneys, building those relationships, and um, yeah, being informed. And, and there's so many aspects to that. So I think yeah, if there's any. I guess some of the questions that I would have had if I could take myself back in time would be around uh, not just incorporating the company, but bringing on advisors, bringing on investors. Um, your partnership agreements within your company, those are all things that are really complex and that um, you should have, you know, ideally engage your attorneys with. So, have any of you had experience with any of those things that you want to share? Or some questions, challenges, things that have wrote, like bumps in the road that have come up? I just joined an organization that's been established since 2011. So they have their attorneys there. 
already locked in. So I know they have the relationships and they use that very carefully when they reach out to them. But in this circumstance, I am, what you just brought up, this is all brand new for me because I'm new to the organization and this, this conference has been very exciting since I have been through the fire hose. With the, your backgrounds, you understand this environment very clearly, whereas the attorneys that they've been working with in 2011 may not. Is that, and that's what your specialty is, correct? So, uh, lawyers can't say they have a specialty. So we have, so we have a passion for blockchain and, and emerging tech, those types of things. Our law firm is a general firm that does corporate work. But to your point, so I, I've been an in-house counsel in a number of different industries, and an important point that I always talk to lawyers who've never been in-house, so I've been, a, I've been a client of legal services, I've been hiring law firms, and that these are key points, that your lawyers should not, you should not be paying for their education of your industry, of your lingo, of your language, of the certain ways that, that uh, a certain company or industry does business. And so, uh, while lawyers don't really specialize other than a few certain areas, it's important to know that you have lawyers that, uh, that know that industry, understand the legal, understand, or, you know, and, and when I was on that side of the world buying legal services, it was important for me that they weren't just, uh, that they really had an interest in what I was doing in my business, so that they weren't just, just giving me lip service about the importance of this business or this industry, that they, that they really were passionate about it. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's an important point. If you don't want to hire an attorney and have them get trained about the blockchain I think that's a key point. It's important to have lawyers that aren't, you know, I, I take it general understanding that you need to expect that your lawyers know the law. They understand the basics of legal work. What's important to, to vet lawyers is is their passion for your business, for your industry, their understanding of it. You know, what, you know, that those types of questions are really the important ones, I think. Thank you. Yeah. I'm, I'm curious to hear what people reaching out to you has looked like in 2017 versus 2018 versus 2019. <laughs> When we had the ICO boom, and then now in Colorado, where we have the Colorado Digital Token Act. So, like, what have those three years looked like, kind of uniquely? So, from where? So he has no gray hair. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, so I, I, I do. I'm involved in a couple things like that. I'm on the our firm is on the Polymath Network, so we'll get clients that come in through those areas. There's been a change in, I, from my view, just a lot of boot kicking and just testing out waters of kind of half-baked ideas, and now it appears to be from just my perspective, and I should tell you, I do work in all kinds of industries, not just, not just the blockchain, but my experience has been that, it, that there are more fully-baked ideas, more fully-baked businesses, more, more, uh, uh, more savvy uh, clients coming that have a little more understanding about, not just, hey, this is a really cool thing, and I don't have a solution for this thing, but it's really cool, and I want to create this website, to now they're, they're really thinking like businesses. I think the other the other dimension of what you're saying um, within the community as a, another business owner, one of the things that we've seen and we've talked about is we're going from minimally viable product or not to now fundraising. And so what we're finding is that some of our corporate structures probably weren't well thought through, mm -hmm. and, and we have to untangle that before we can bring in investors because the investors are much more sophisticated than kind of friends and family rounds. Mm -hmm. And so for the last three years, unless you made a lot of money in a token offering, and even then you're kind of you know, worried about that because there may be the backlash of whether that was an equity play or not. Yeah. Part of our, so yesterday, one of the key points I was trying to get across to people was that there's this whole world between friends and family and being a public company that a lot of, we all kind of hear the terms about Reg D and Reg A, but better trying, you know, that's been kind of one of my goals, is trying to demystify this process and remove some of the complexity of it. But there are all these options out there that, that companies, whether they're not just not just blockchain-based companies, but any, anybody's looking for funding, that are available. And there's there's investors out there that are looking for, for companies, but what they also are looking for is companies that they kind of have gone through the process, understand you know, what these things are, understand what a company really should look like, don't just create a, a piece of technology and then expect money. Go ahead. Just, could you explain how law firm economics come into play when you are working with clients and the pressures that 
you and I are experiencing, the pressures that attorneys feel when they're bringing in clients and what they have to do to make their organization profitable. Because I'm not sure people in the business, in the business world, yeah, I got to call a lawyer, but you know, people need to remember law firms and businesses too. Yeah. So this, this is a great topic. It's one that I, I can go on for hours about. There's some fundamental issues and we've talked through, there's some fundamental issues in the legal business world. The billable hour is one. Uh, the way we train lawyers is another. The, there's all the, the inability for us to really be incentivized to use technologies that add value to our clients. Because if I'm going to use a new uh, Wizbane AI software program that, that reviews documents for me, that has no incentive for me if I'm billing by the hour. Just doesn't doesn't make sense in the legal world. And so law firms are starting now to get some pressure to do these things where they're now starting to, to look differently at the way that they interact with clients. And it goes to a little bit what I'm talking about, that lawyers now are starting to be act more like businesses. We're starting to really understand that we need to know your business. It's more of a B2B business situation than what we've had for decades, which is a monopoly on legal services, and we could act however we wanted to. And so to to his point, uh, it depends a bit on the law firm structure, you know, whether you've got this partnership group at the top and they are um, understanding of these new technologies or whether or not they've got this benevolent overlord who's going to decide which way the firm is going to go and whether or not that person is, is, is savvy and keen on new technology or not, and savvy and keen not just on technology but on the culture and society of, of corporations and organizations that also needs to change. And I'm sorry I got the five minute warning, so I want to make sure I've got other people involved here if we have other questions. And also, we're all going to be around to talk if we all want to talk on any of these topics more deeply. Um, Aaron? Yeah, uh, I kind of would just echo what Brent has said and what uh, everyone else has kind of just talked about. That it makes a difference on who we work with on the front end. Uh, I've had experiences of people coming to me after the fact because they use other services that wasn't a lawyer and they use standard templates and now they're coming to us to help fix their problem mm -hmm. and just knowing that there is value in getting in early and having an end goal like Brent was talking about, an exit plan and what you specifically want to do. Yeah. Could you briefly, uh, in less than a minute, explain the dangers of having Google as your lawyer? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so I had clients uh, send me stuff that they thought was relevant to uh, the specific issue and um, they're not lawyers and they don't really understand the kind of legality and precedence that we do in a sense. Um, so in, like Brent was talking about, the monopoly that lawyers have over the field itself. Um, yeah, Google is a helpful tool for a lot of things, um, but again, it, having the intel and understanding of how the legal system works, uh, Google isn't your best friend. Uh, that's kind of where we come in. Just, just to add one piece of this, it's, it, it's literally not some magic thing about when I get a law degree, I now know something that everybody doesn't. What it is, is day in and day out. Day in, all day long, we're reading contracts, and all day long we have new counterparties with new creative ideas about how they're going to do a certain thing. And so those are the things that, that you know, when you, when you get an agreement online that you don't recognize. And I can come, I mean, there's a million examples, right? There's a million examples about, uh, I could give you, uh, the Colorado had, the Colorado LLC law requires voting by the, by the number of members, not percent ownership. This has come up, I've had more clients that have gotten in trouble because they think that their voting rights are based on their ownership percentages, but it's not by law unless you change it in an LLC. It's just an example, there's a million of those. And it's these things that lawyers do on a regular basis that cause, that people, it's, to my slide, you don't know what you don't know on some of this stuff. And it's difficult for us to sit up here and explain it all to you, uh, but that's a good point. Sir. Um, something that I've been covering this space for about two years now. I'm starting to see projects that ICO two years ago. There's, they ran out of funds, and now they're doing traditional equity phrases. So I'm, start, I'm wondering, what are sort of like conflicts between having done an ICO and now doing a traditional equity raise? So it's, I said this yesterday, anybody that tells you securities is easy is lying to you. Securities law is extremely complicated. It's the one area I see more lawyers get into trouble than any other area. And so your question is a bit complicated because it depends on how they did the ICO. It depends on what they did. You know, I'm seeing now, two days ago, there were, I saw two ICOs that are now getting, finally getting their SEC fines. These have kind of taken a while to get through the process and to see you know, who's done what, how they've done it. And I think we had the commissioners on yesterday, and you'll listen to the SEC commissioners. That they're, they, the reason you're so frustrated with them is there is no simple answer. It's very fact-specific, and so 
if you do a secondary raise, they can't, there, there's, depending on how you did it, some of these things can't be combined, some can't, it depends on how it was done, it depends on what kind of a raise was done, how, the structure of it. And so, uh, sorry, the short answer. starting to see more and more of yeah. these companies that are asking these questions now. Yeah, the short answer is, can you, is, it gonna, is an ICO going to have an impact on your new raise? It could. Yeah. Uh, depends on the structure of it. Sorry. The best answer I'll ever give is it depends. <laughs> <laughs> also, don't be afraid of lawyers to say I don't know. That's, a, that's another key point that I'd like to get across is um, you know, the, the ones that have an answer fairly get are missing out on something. The only final thought I just want to reiterate, I know we're short on time, but is that find lawyers that you can work with and if cost is a factor, like you can use the things like Cooley Docs and the resources that are out there. Uh, but definitely uh, make sure to like run it by your attorneys and, and, and work with them, like have those conversations, like maybe they're open to doing like a subscription model, we talked about that earlier, and uh, just having those conversations on, on cost and being able to plan ahead, but finding attorneys that you can build a good relationship with is definitely important. Yeah, from a startup perspective, one of the things that um, we were talking about, I know we've got close enough time, but the, uh, one minute, okay. So, um, the, the notion is transaction focused. So from a, from a company perspective, there's no reason you shouldn't, once you're building out your P&L, um, have a prepaid account that you're actually funding so that you can actually pay your attorney fees and not basically be working on minimal cash flow. Because the reality is it's going to take your time to build up vendor relationships. So there's a lead time before you get to the point of an agreement. Well, if you're not planning for that, and you actually have, then you're pulling out immediate cash flow, you get this spike, right? So from a P&L perspective, from the entrepreneur's perspective, you should put that into your budget. It's a line item. And then, you know, you know ideally, um, you have a firm that you can work with that has a couple different dimensions that you can work with on a number of different things. But even then, it doesn't really, from an entrepreneur's perspective, you need to really plan for that. And in some cases, it doesn't work. If you're going to do IP issues, um, where you're planning to do IP work, then you know you need to put that into your budget. And, and don't be shy about that, because that's where people get surprised. So. All right, we're done. Uh, thank you all for coming. Again, we'll be around uh, if you have any questions. Or we've also got, I think, some, some, some swag over there and a place to put your card if you'd like. So thank you all. All right, thanks. Uh,